So I've now had a delivery of the X2 capacitor. This is meant to be a 3 amp uh, plug with a 3 amp socket in it. This is the story of Daphne, who longs to be alone with her very own BBC Micro. Alas for Daphne, Acorn have also made it rather attractive to small businessmen. Hello, Dad. <laughs> Tragically, they've even made it irresistible to accountants. Hello, Uncle Sol. How did you get going? And sad to say, it's become vital for everyone who needs up-to-the-minute information. Thanks to its Prestel and Teletext adapters. Worst of all, it's absolutely bung-ho for busy administrators. And then there are those visitors who want to use its unearthly scientific potential. Poor Daphne. The BBC microcomputer system is a world leader and it's still growing. Hello and welcome to another Retro Crazy. Today I'm diving into the world of the iconic BBC Micro Model B. Released in 1981 and discontinued in 1994, this legendary computer took the UK by storm. A working prototype was literally cobbled together in a week by the Acorn team in response to the BBC Computer Literacy Project where it exceeded the requested specifications in nearly every area. A deal was quickly struck in February 1981, final specs agreed by June, and an initial production started in December. At the time, over 80% of UK schools had BBC microcomputers in them, and over its lifetime, the BBC Micro Model B sold over one and a half million units, making it a true classic in the world of computing. For me, it was a cutting edge machine that I used daily as part of my O level in computer studies. There really wasn't a Scottish equivalent at that time, so we used the English course. I still have fond memories of carrying around boxes of five and a quarter floppy disks containing not my coursework, but the latest and greatest titles available at the time. I bought this particular machine recently from a very good family friend, complete with five and a quarter drive and software, so I'm hoping this will clean up nicely and just show what an excellent system the BBC Model B is. Ironically, this is actually my third BBC Micro. The second system is completely boxed, in pristine condition, fully recapped, restored, and currently sitting in my storage unit. However, the first one I owned has a rather sad tale. It was one of the first machines I bought when I decided I was properly going to start collecting. I spent the time, I recapped the power supply as everybody advises you to do, and when it was all put back together, it worked, but there was a hum from the, the speaker. So I spoke to a lovely gentleman whose uh, details I will put on screen because trust me, if you need anything for BBC, speak to this man. He is superb and he helped me so much. It was unbelievable. And what he said was, send down your BBC and let me know what you want done. I'll tweak and tune the power supply so the hum goes. And that sounded excellent. I had also managed to purchase a Sidewise uh, ROM expansion card, so a whole bunch of stuff was bundled up with the BBC, it was very well packaged, and a colleague of mine at the company I work for was uplifting stuff from where I worked to take it back to our warehouse for dispatch. So I gave him the box and I asked him to dispatch that and obviously I would pay the company back for the shipping. He was out the door no more than 10 minutes when I got a phone call saying, uh, 
you're not going to believe this, but your BBC's fallen out. And I'm like, what? He went, yeah, people were flashing me on the, the dual carriageway. So he stopped and realised that the back door of the uh, vehicle had popped open and the only box that was missing out the back was my BBC. So he retraced the route and then phoned me and said, I found it, the box is intact, it's further back on the dual carriageway, I'll try and recover it. It's absolutely fine. Oh, a truck's just run over it. And that was it. What he brought back for me was bits. There was not a complete section at all. In fact, most of it was actually missing. I did recover some of the keys, some of the key caps, a little bit of some of the circuit board, but very little that's usable. Ironically, I still have a lot of the key caps and the key switches. So at some point I'll pop them up for sale on eBay, try and recoup some of the, the money I'd spent. And that was it, he, he didn't even offer to pay for what was obviously his mistake by not latching the door correctly. So my first BBC, unfortunately, passed away in sad circumstances. And if I can find some of the pictures of what was left, I'll pop them on the screen just now. So today, join me as I try to restore this piece of history and relive the golden age of home computers. This is going to be fun. Hopefully on the back you will be able to see, there we are. So we've got UHF out, video out, RGB, RS-232, cassette. Moving along, you've got analog in, Econet, but this one was never fitted with the Econet board. And obviously at the very end, your power switch. And the rest of the expansion ports we're actually on the underside, underneath the keyboard. So if we flip it over, we can start with one just simply marked tube, the one megahertz bus, a user port, your printer port. Here we have the disk drive port and tucked away here is auxiliary power output, which provides 5 volts, 12 volts and minus 5 volts for any peripherals. Now, the only one that's worn on the back is the disk drive port because obviously this does have a disk drive that goes with it. It's in not too bad condition considering it's been stored in an attic. It's going to need a full strip down and clean. It always had a nice feeling keyboard. Okay, it may not sound the greatest, but it was a good full travel keyboard. So let's pop this open. And first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna lift out the power supply, which sits down here. Because trust me, we are not powering this on until this has been touched. So as I remember, we've got two screws here and then one screw, two screws to take out. So let's pop this apart. So with the casing off, we get our first look at the inside of the BBC. We've got the keyboard connector here, which is a rigid connector. So I need to make sure that's carefully lifted off. This is all of the feeds from the power supply. And there are seven of these. We've got to make sure we get them back in the right places when it goes back in. So it just hooks on to a number of points on the board. We have our speaker, which is here. Again, attached to part of the keyboard and the connector is underneath. Back here, which you can't see yet, are some of the ROM sockets. Because the BBC was nice, you could plug in different ROMs to do different things. So you could have one that did a word processor or you could have one that did the disk filing system. So you could buy a base machine and then configure it later. So rather nice. The keyboard itself is held in with one, two, these are nuts. And on the underside there are the screws. So that'll need to come off before we can disconnect this and lift it out. 
the power supply has a number of screws on the underside that we'll also need to disconnect before we can lift this out separately. Now this has not been powered on for decades so I'm in no you know, danger from the voltages in there. One of the things I did say to uh, the friends of the family when they were saying that this was coming up for sale was not to switch it on because uh, this contains a reefer. And if you don't know what a reefer cap is, let's just say they are notorious, especially on things like the BBC Micro, of releasing the magic smoke. And when they do, they poo over everything and it makes one hell of a mess and a stink and yeah, not nice. So rip them out, throw them away, start again. Now, just from here, you can see there's a couple of caps on the board that I'll be replacing as well. One tucked here. Again, while they may well be okay, I will be replacing them to ensure that we get the, the best from this machine. So let's undo these, lift the keyboard off, and then we can undo the screws, disconnect all the wiring, and lift everything out of the way. So there we are, that's the motherboard out. It's not too bad, it's a little bit dusty, nothing a, a quick blow off won't, uh, won't fix. We've got one, two, just the two caps, three caps on the main board. Nope. Six, we've got three tucked away down here. So we'll be replacing those. But before we go anywhere, I'm going to pop this to the side and we're going to have a look at that power supply. Power supplies are dangerous. There are components in these that can hold a charge long after they're unplugged from the mains. So if you're unsure what you're doing, go seek professional advice. So here's the power supply still in its case. So obviously I'm going to have to pop it out the case to be able to work on it. That will involve things like this connection here, uh, which is the earth, because that runs uh, right the way across um, and into the transformer here. We've got uh, this, the main switch here, which sometimes you can get to pop off and come forward, give you enough room. I'm trying to remember how I did it the last time. I do remember everything kind of has to slide out to the side However, you can see that little monster sitting in there. Try and point it out. This thing here, this horrible rifa, or reefer, however you want to pronounce it, this, this needs removed and re replaced. Just looking inside, there are no skid marks. It has not blown. It has not been powered up. So that's great. So let's get this thing apart. And then let me make sure I've got enough caps to actually do this, because I've never thought to check before I started. So now that I've got all the caps together, it turns out I'm missing one of the, uh, one of the stupid things. Isn't that just typical? <laughs> so I'll be able to strip all the caps off the board. I'll be able to put all the fresh ones back on, but I'll get a matching pair. So that's going to be the last thing to happen. Now, as normal, you'll see I've marked up the circuit board. I'm marking where everything is. Uh, I'm marking a circle with the value in the center. Uh, capacitance and voltage and then the little dash or the minus sign is actually showing where the polarity is by comparison and you can see if we look at one of them this one down here the minus symbol is at the bottom and when we look at it there's the minus marking at the bottom right let's get all the caps off this board
And there we are, that most evil of things, the reefer cap. I don't know if you'll be able to see the crack right the way through it, through the surface. But yeah, um, they, they fail and that one's very ready to go. You can see the cracks right the way through. Yeah, hate the things, pretty much everybody does not good and if I'm not mistaken that's also uh, a reefer so better they are gone okay let's give this a clean and then we'll look at replacing the caps so just before I go replacing some of these caps let's see what's happening with modern technology and miniaturization they, they are considerably smaller and if we look at the classic example of the thousands yeah what a difference right let's get these replaced So now we're on to the main board. I've got six capacitors that I want to replace. I've given it a basic wipe down. It's a lot better, it's not as dusty. So let's crack on and get uh, these off and replaced. So I've gone ahead and I've replaced all the caps on the main board. This is the old ones. Look at the difference in size in some of them. Phenomenal the change. That's uh, a fraction of the size, yeah. Okay, so while I didn't necessarily show this, it's all done. I can pop the mainboard to the side and move on to giving the case and the plastics and the keyboard a good clean. So it's a few hours later, the sun has come out and is streaming through the back window. So let's get this stripped. Now there are three screws that hold the speaker on. I'll undo that. Lift the bracket off and I can lift the speaker out. I can see lots of fluff in there, so we'll need to give all that a clean. We'll pop the key caps. I'm going to replace this capacitor and then we'll give the base a clean and then I can get the caps along with the case a way through for a good clean. So I've now had the delivery of the missing X2 capacitor I required to finish this. Unfortunately I only got one of those in that colour, so I'll have to use a slightly different one but still 0.22 UF. So let's get these finished off and the rest of the power supply put back together.
So that's the power supply back into a position where I can test it. I haven't pushed the clip all the way through. I haven't pushed the power switch all the way through. This will still allow me, oh, hopefully to switch it on and off without having to go near it. And I can check what the output voltages are on the cable. So before I do that, I'm gonna go and give this cable a quick clean. So there's a couple of checks I want to do before I power it on. I want to make sure the fuse back here is fine. And we've got continuity. This is meant to be a three amp fuse. So let's check and see what it is. So it is three amps. Let's check and make sure we have continuity. Which we do. So we're about ready to test. So going to voltage, DC, let's see if we can get this to power up without going bang. So let's use this to stop it from moving and I'm going to power it on and hopefully nothing goes bang. No smoke, no bang. Now this is quite dangerous, usual warnings apply as you have seen. So let's see what we get in the way of output. So here, five volts, also five volts, also five volts. And that I think should be minus five volts. Minus, it's low, but it's minus five volts. So the power supply is giving out exactly what it should. We do have some outputs at the back, which should include a 12 volt output, I do believe. So let's try and turn this without touching it too much. <laughs> Minus 5 volts, nothing. 12 volts, 5 volts, nothing, and nothing on that one. So we're getting an output on these, that's fine, and I'm getting the 12 volts required. So let's power this off and finish rebuild. So that's us finished assembly, power supply is in, everything is connected up. I've checked the board actually has zero volts for all of the the negative or the ground wires so they are all in the right place that one's the odd one out tucks down there i've rerouted the speaker cable to be a bit further away from the power leads and typically yes you need to actually fit this before you put the keyboard in hey it happens we live and learn as they say every day is a school day right i've got power in power is on I've got an RF cable connected. You can't actually see it, can you? Okay, I've got an RF cable connected to the monitor. All that's left to do is power on and see what happens. Well, haha, <laughs> she lives. Um, okay, sorry about the reflection on the, the screen. I don't have an ideal setup here. There are issues of, yeah, yeah. If you saw the setup properly, you'd understand. Hopefully that will change in the future. Unfortunately, I'm going to guess that's the best it's going to go. I am using RF and an LCD. There's probably incompatibilities there. I don't currently have a proper video cable for the BBC. I will be purchasing one, I think. Let's see what the keyboard does. Excellent. It's it's running, it's working, it's doing exactly what it should. Right. I am actually going to end the video here. I'm, I'll put the casing back on, but at this moment in time, that's as far as I'm taking this. I will be looking at the disk drive in the next part and we'll look at 
running something and, and actually playing properly. Yay! Yeah, hey. I am getting a little bit of static feedback or some white noise. So I'll need to investigate that, see if there's anything I can do. But a successful restoration. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. And I'll see you on the next Retro Crazy.